The year is 1984. A baby girl has a fever this evening. She's fussy. Watchful waiting, watchful waiting, and now she won't feed. And just seems very sleepy. Her parents do their best to keep their composure and drive carefully but quickly to the local hospital. They park the car. They pick up their shuffled pace with blanket and bag and tow, making sure not to miss this turn there or follow that sign there. The maze opens up to a small blank space, and they're told to sit. The dim light of the waiting room flickers. Its gray hum is no welcoming beacon at this hour of the night. They've done everything they could think of at home for their little daughter. Are they overreacting? Dark thoughts well up with each undefined moment that passes alone in this place. The baby is brought back. The parents begin to feel a twinge of relief as the staff look the baby over. The twinge turns to a pang. She is not well. They inform her parents that they don't have the equipment to take care of her. They just don't stock it. No one around likely does either. We're very sorry. There is not much we can do. We can get some medicine to her muscle. We can try to get her to the children's hospital. But you know, by the time it takes to do this, she'll probably not survive her meningitis. Deep breath in and out. We are back in the here and now. Imagine this small infant arriving to your emergency department today, tonight. How would you assess and treat her? What are the resources at your disposal? What are the expectations of you and your institution? What are the processes in place to help get her what she needs when she needs it? Not too long ago, acutely ill and injured children were simply turned away. It's hard to wrap our minds around it. Even from the ambulance bay, medics were told, take them to man's best hospital down the road. Or the more stable little patients were often grossly underserved. We just don't have little sizes, you understand. This dismal state and lack of readiness were the crucible to spark a guiding light that led to a way out. Step by step, with the leadership and hard work of countless dedicated people, this led to the establishment of Emergency Medical Services for Children program in the United States. And it's one of the reasons you're listening to this program right now. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horachko. Pediatric readiness is not just an ideal or a goal. It's a tangible plan. It's a series of benchmarks, a toolkit, and better yet, it's an attitude. There are specific things that your institution does right now or can do better today to make your hospital safer for young patients. There are also specific things that you can do right now to be more prepared. Today, we'll talk about how you can make a difference. How you can be a leader, a great example to your colleagues, and how you can make yourself better and better, little by little, every day. First, a little background. There are over 24 million pediatric emergency visits per year in the United States. And they range, of course, from the worried well to the critically ill. So that's today's special on the menu. Here's your recipe 
for disaster. Take one part excellent physiologic compensatory mechanisms in children, measure out one part subtle presentation, because children often appear generally well until they precipitously crash. Add to that two parts coming in early in the disease process because we're open 24-7. Fold into that one part increasing visits due to hospital or clinic closures to two parts thinly spread expertise. Mix that all up and bake it in a deprioritized oven until golden brown and a toothpick in the center comes out with problems with reimbursement and difficulty in transporting to referral centers. And this is how you bake the perfectly disastrous pediatric upside-down cake. Not so tasty, is it? But it's still the reality today. We have hope. We're getting better. Thanks to the National Pediatric Readiness Project, we are turning a page in this country. In 2015, Dr. Marianne Gaushi hill et al. published a National Assessment of Pediatric Readiness in Emergency Departments in JAMA Pediatrics. Their goal was to assess pediatric readiness as defined by the 2009 Guidelines for Care of Children in Emergency Departments. They used a modified Delphi process to construct a weighted pediatric readiness score. You'll recall that the Delphi technique is a structured method to crystallize expert input in as non-biased a way as possible. You know how it goes. You're in a meeting with others, and sometimes the loudest voice has the greatest influence. The Delphi method is a remedy to this. Okay, well, we went there, so this is how it works. There's a problem, and we need some way of forecasting its effects or how we should best deal with them. But there really is no literature. There's no set objective criteria for this. So we're relying on experts, but we want to make sure that we're not biased. All participants are anonymous. The idea is to avoid that one voice having too much weight or everyone jumping in on the same bandwagon. The information flow is structured. There is initial questionnaire and a commentary from the experts, and then a facilitator will summarize it, filter out all the noise, and come up with something that represents the questions to the group in a regular feedback model. Progress is made with each iteration. So in the Delphi method, you have the anonymity that you need to get to the honest core of the matter, the structure you need to help move the project along, and ongoing feedback to refine the process. So then you can ask a question of the oracle and hopefully get a meaningful response to aid you in your hero's journey. This is how Gaussi et al. set up the metrics for pediatric readiness simple questions like what type of equipment do you have what size et tubes what size iv catheters all of those basic things that sometimes we take for granted not everyone has other basic questions like do you have a disaster plan do you have a guideline for transfer to another facility and many many more this questionnaire was refined over and over again until we have the final product which generates this weighted pediatric readiness score. It's an objective measure of whether that institution is ready to take care of acutely ill and injured children. And it's meant to be a comparison to others with similar resources, but also it's a way forward to help that institution improve its readiness. They surveyed 5,017 EDs and got an 82.7% response rate. Now, if you've ever done any type of survey-based research, you'll know how difficult it is to get this phenomenal response. All of this, of course, is due to the passion and dedication of his researchers who really worked this project to its full potential. About half of these EDs offered basic services. One-third were general emergency departments, 10% were comprehensive medical centers, and 4% were standby facilities. Of these, 
60% were urban, 10% suburban, 20% rural, and 10% remote. Now, this is a really great broad sampling of what it looks like to be an emergency department in this country. They found some interesting facts that were previously not known. 39% of responding hospitals saw less than five children per day. 30% saw five to 14 children per day, and only 14% saw more than 25 children per day. So that expertise is spread thin. The hospitals that had low volume, of course, had a readiness score of 61.4 out of 100. But even those who had high volumes of pediatric patients only scored 89.8 out of 100. The median for all was 68.9 points out of 100. Just think if you were to convert that to a letter grade, makes you want to do more homework, right? An interesting finding, really crucial in understanding readiness, was the effect of having a pediatric emergency care coordinator. This is someone who may be an RN or an MD or someone clinical who is simply paying attention to what is needed for pediatric emergency patients. When the researchers adjusted for the presence of a pediatric care coordinator in that institution, Gauchy et al. found that that readiness score was anywhere from 10 to 20 points higher than those facilities without someone minding the shop. They were also four times more likely to have a quality improvement plan, and these EDs were much more likely to have the needed equipment and supplies, the policies in place, and they ranked higher in competency for staff. What a difference one person can make. All right, we get it. Some people are just more on top of things than others. There's bound to be variability, right? Sure. But now that we have an objective measure, we can study things more clearly. A subsequent study in 2019 by Ames et al. in Pediatrics titled Emergency Department Pediatric Readiness and Mortality in Critically Ill Children hit this message home. They studied 20,483 critically ill children, not the unscheduled care or the ones who could eventually be seen by their own doctors. These were sick kids presenting to 426 hospitals in five states in various regions in the United States. In this study, presentation to a hospital with a higher readiness score was associated with a lower odds of death. Patients presenting to a hospital with the lowest pediatric readiness score had four times the odds of death than those with the highest score. Now that is profound. Readiness matters. So let's talk about what your department can do and what you can do personally to be ready for that child when he or she needs you the most. Based on the current literature, your department can do quite a few things, but the first thing to do is to designate someone as the pediatric champion, the pediatric emergency care coordinator. These are qualified clinicians who help with educational programs. They participate in quality improvement projects. They review policies and serve as liaisons to represent the needs of the pediatric population. Now, this doesn't mean that everything needs to be in order all at once, all right now. If your ED doesn't have a coordinator and you or someone you would like to nominate doesn't have it all figured out overnight, that's okay. Start with the pressing issues first and build on them. Remember, this is a continuous quality improvement measure. Number one, designate that physician or nurse or tag team as the emergency care coordinator. If you can do one thing that will improve readiness and, frankly, mortality, it's that. Number two, talk to the other departments and other facilities in your region and come up with a disaster plan. While you're at it, 
What about a family-centered care plan or a pediatric mental health care plan? Let's stop this cycle of dealing with each of these issues as they come and reinventing the wheel each time. It's frustrating for us. It's not helpful for our patients. Work with your people to come up with policies and plans to streamline care. Everyone will be relieved and thank you for it. And most importantly, your patients will do better. Okay, that's great. And all of that takes time and momentum to build. But how can we start being more ready right now? A few things that will change your practice for the good. And you may already be doing this. First, the low-hanging fruit. Require that children are weighed in kilograms only. Never in pounds. There are still places that do this. It's dangerous. Recording a weight in pounds when it can easily be confused with kilograms or vice versa is just asking for a medical error. I would go even further to say that even saying the weight out loud in pounds is asking for trouble. People may mishear you, and in a critical, time-sensitive situation, you don't have any do-overs. Now, while I'm on my mini rant on kilogram weights, do yourself a favor and only use Celsius for children. The difference between lumbar puncture or not, sepsis rule out or not, may depend on using the right scale. Plus, all of the literature on fever and sepsis is in Celsius, and you're only asking for trouble by trying to do some mental math and carrying that decimal. The next thing to do right now is to consider the child in context. Every episode, every patient, every family unit. He presents with certain symptoms or a certain duration and severity with certain physical findings. How excited we get about them or what our differential diagnosis may be will depend on the context. The child's age, of course, his birth history, very important, his comorbidities, but also his parents and what role they play in all of this. Remember, there's a little bit of a filter sometimes of the information transmitted to us through the caregiver. A three-week-old with fever and no source is very different from a three-month-old or a three-year-old with fever and no source, but also very different as far as the resources that the parents have to come back to be rechecked or what your return precautions may look like. You can't even start to assess or risk stratify or figure much out without knowing what the context of the child is. Building on our personal pediatric readiness, I want to share with you an ancient Jedi trick taught to me and now to you by the great Marianne Gaushi Hill. She calls it just part of her own personal readiness. She is so awesome and so humble at the same time. Others may call it deliberate practice. I call it deliberate preparation. Since critical illness doesn't happen all of the time, and our patients completely vary, they may be just bigger than a bread box or the size of a flatbed, we have a huge range of variability in presentation, and so our preparation needs to be nimble. The next time you go in to see a child, especially one where you know everything's okay, Maybe the worried well toddler who has a, an upper respiratory tract looks well. Use this time to do a little deliberate preparation. Okay, she's two years old, so she should be about 12 kilos. If she stops breathing, I would use the pediatric bag valve mask. I'd get a 22 gauge IV in her, or maybe a pink IO needle and a proximal tibia. Let's see, I also would get the nurse to help calculate meds because, well, math is hard. But I know that I can grab a Miller one and a half, and ET, to si ET tube size is age over four plus four, so 0 0.5 plus four, 4.5 uncuffed, maybe a four cuffed, and so on. Use that time to be more prepared. 
Now, one day you can practice RSI meds. The next day you can practice intubation equipment. And the next day, chest tube sizes. This does a few things. First, it dusts off the old cobwebs from time to time, and we all need that. Also, it helps keep us focused and aware that any one of the children we see in the ED is a potential critical patient. Now, you've heard me say this before, but I think it bears repeating now. In adults, disease is dumber. It's more obvious. You'll get more hands on deck almost immediately because everyone sees it from across the room. In children, disease is trickier. It's more subtle. You may have to rally the troops. You will only see what you're looking for. Another way to say it is chance favors the prepared mind. Going through this deliberate preparedness, even a few times a shift, makes it more enjoyable. You're using your critical care skills. You're also taking off the bite of a potentially anxiety-inducing situation. Going through this deliberate preparedness, even a few times a shift, makes it more enjoyable. You're using your critical care skills. You're also taking off the bite of a potentially anxiety-inducing situation. If you are always in the mindset of being ready for whatever, you will be when it counts. Let's bring this all together with a case. Instead of trying to tinker with a medical mystery, let's see how many errors we can pile up here. Now, we've all made one or all of these mistakes that we'll talk about, and hopefully, little by little, we make less and less of them. In these difficult times recently, watching out for each other is how we're going to make it through, and it's also our collective superpower. Here we go. You get a radio call that the medics are bringing in a two-week-old baby girl with seizure. They are just trying to get over here, and the communication is scant and brief. From what you can gather, there has been no known trauma, the blood glucose is 70, and they are assisting ventilations. They'll be here in five minutes. What does your deliberate preparation tell you? Forget that. You're already a bit flustered, and the nurses are too. Where is everything, and where is everybody? The child arrives. She has periods of apnea, and you bring her over to the gurney, put a bump under her shoulders. You bring her jaw up into the mask, being careful not to press on the soft tissues under her chin. You're starting to feel a bit more in control. Okay, time to delegate. Uh, there's a lot of crosstalk in the room. You're not really sure if you're even heard. What was that nurse's name again? Um, uh, yes, uh, you, you. Can you work on access? Uh, your hands are tied, trying to focus on keeping the little one's airway open and ventilated. What weight do we have? Where's the Braslow? Nobody knows. The medics chime in. Mom says the baby weighs nine. Huh? Wait, what? But before you can even process that, the nurses are already asking you what is next. Luckily, you get someone to put in an I.O., access. Good. This child isn't breathing. Uh, we've been bagging for some time. He needs antiepileptics and uh, maybe intubation if I can't get this under control. Uh, okay, uh, nine times 0 0.1 mg per kg of lorazepam is rounded to about a milligram. Is that right? Okay. The child is small, but uh, the nurse pushes it. Uh, you notice that you are no longer assisting ventilation. The child is now apneic. How much for said did we give? One milligram like you ordered, doctor. Are we sure about the weight? The medics are still there, curious as to know how the baby's doing. One proudly chimes in. Yes, mom said nine pounds. Wait, nine pounds? You try to rack your basic calculator in your head, but you can't remember. The only thing you can remember is 2.2 .2 times the difference in kilos to pounds. Uh, you're stuck. It's time to intubate and stop. Your nurses are giving 200 international units of phosphenatoin. No, no, re please recalculate that. More delays, more tension. Uh, okay, uh, what's the blade size? 
uh, okay, good. Someone found the Braslow. No, we're not red on the Braslow. We're two colors down. Gray. It's f- only four kilograms. You grab the right equipment. With a shaky hand now, you're fortunate to get a 3-0 cuffed ET tube past the cords. You secure it. Seizure activity slowing. You breathe out. And Oh, man, I never want that to happen again. Except it does. The child starts seizing again. Anyone know what we usually give after phosphonatoin? You're just a bit frazzled at this point. No, we don't have a guideline or policy at this hospital. You try one agent, then the other, and no effect. Then you remember, in all of this, your training kicks in. We assess, intervene, and reassess. Let's be methodical. How do we go forward? Kilograms. We got that untangled. Okay, deliberate preparation. So much for that. Better luck next time. Wait. Uh, okay, the patient in context. This doesn't make sense. I need more information. The child is intubated, ventilated. You go over to the mother who is weeping in a chair in the corner. You search for some birth history. The baby is only taking a vitamin supplement as recommended by the pediatrician. Okay, that sounds pretty run-of-the-mill, but wait a minute. Um, All babies should be on vitamin D, but um, something nudges you to ask further. What vitamin? Is this something you need a prescription for? Yes. Hmm. The context brings it all together. Now you remember the nurse's name, Rhonda. She turns her head with a pleasing look, waiting for you to give some direction. Rhonda, we need 100 milligrams of pyridoxine STAT. Status epilepticus in the neonate refractory to standard treatment. Think pyridoxine deficiency. So, uh, how many errors can we count in that case? More importantly, how can we make sure it doesn't happen again? Whether you believe it in your bones right now as you hear my voice or not, you are a change agent. And why not? You live and breathe and contribute, right? You're smart. You know things. When you see something that needs improving, take the time to point it out. Don't just let it go. Follow through. At the very least, you make your life better and easier the next time you need a piece of equipment or you need to have a debriefing with staff. Small changes add up to big benefits. But it all starts with us and our own personal and institutional readiness. We got this. In summary... Pediatric readiness is not just a mindset, it's a toolkit. Your institution's goals should be, one, designate a pediatric emergency care coordinator. This can be a physician or a nurse who is qualified in emergency medicine or pediatric emergency medicine. Two, include children in your disaster plan and develop policies that include the needs of acutely ill and injured children. Three, participate in peds ready we're in this together and there is no need for you to reinvent the wheel even if you have a pretty good setup now the toolkit and checklists are worth reviewing if only to make sure you know where everything is in your department links are in the show notes and also of course your own personal pediatric readiness one weigh only in kilograms measure only in celsius Two, see the child in context. Who is he and what is he at risk for developing? What is normal and what's unexpected? What are your resources? Three, finally, deliberate preparation will save you quite a bit of heartburn and better yet, will make your job more fun and more satisfying. I'd like to take this moment to say a particular thank you to Dr. Marianne Gaushi Hill for her vision, her passion, her hard work, and her perseverance, as well as for her 
mentorship, and friendship. We all owe her a debt of gratitude. And until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.